Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. We're, be, we're continuing on in our series uh, about joy. And so uh, on the screen is going to be Philippians 4.4, 4, which is kind of our key verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And as we learned last week, yes, there, there are some of us who, because of temperament, are more joyful on the outside than others. Some of us are more tiggers. Some of us are more eors. And if you don't understand that reference... Like, so be it. Uh, but what we learned last week is that biblical joy transcends DNA. And, and so even in this tough situation in which Paul is writing, the Philippians are in a crisis, Paul himself is in jail, and, and yet what we have here is a command, a command to rejoice. And it's not only a command, joy is not only a command, it's also a fruit. And so kind of the fascinating thing is this is not something we can manufacture in of ourselves. And so biblical joy is just simply this, a deep and abiding pleasure and gladness in God. And circumstances cannot diminish it. And in fact, we are to always rejoice. And you say, well, how is that even possible? Because of this. We are rejoicing in the Lord. And the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because he never changes, our joy has no need to change as well. And, and, and we know that, listen, that the, the, the early church would have said, really, Paul, are we to rejoice in the Lord always? And he repeats it again just so that it's emphasized. Yes, I say rejoice. And, and, and so, you, you know, today... We're going to look at a connection between joy and, of all things, strength. Because if you think about our church, given the, the world we live in, in which, what, it is very hostile to the church. Jesus himself said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. We live in a world where there's lots of temptation. And, and so what do we need? We need to be strong. We need strength. And not only we as a church, obviously that also includes each of us as individuals. And, and so what's kind of the opposite of strength would be weakness. It would be giving in. It would be compromise. It would be never being able to resist the pressures that are against us, which would result in us being conformed to the world. And so when we're talking about strength, think about it this way, that, that it is the power to endure. It is the strength to exert energy to meet the opposition. It's courage. It is the ability or the, the resolve to stand on God's word and to never compromise. In the end, what, is, what does that mean? It means that we're able to obey him at all times. And so to this week, we're looking at the connection of joy and strength. And so that's why we're in Nehemiah. Now, I realize we had a sermon series on Nehemiah, and you can go back and actually listen to a sermon on this passage. All we're going to do today is kind of look at the surface and, and draw some conclusions. So we're going to begin at verse 1 and jump around a bit. And, and re recall that the, the Jews had been transported uh, out of the country, and now we're brought back. They rebuilt the temple, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and that's the context. And all of the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And so here's the key. It's the word of God. Verse 3. And he, Ezra, read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. Uh, yeah, there you go, for those who are worried about our length of our services. In the presence of men and women and those who could understand. Keep your eye on this word. This really is a key word in this passage. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. They weren't letting these words just pass by. They were hanging on them. They were seeking to actually understand them. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And again, so Ezra is obviously engaged in teaching. He's reading the word of God, teaching, and that leads to what? Worship. That's the proper sequence. Verse 7, uh, there's a whole bunch of individuals that you can practice at lunch uh, pronouncing. Uh, they're Levites, and what did they do? They helped the people 
to understand, there's that word again, to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And so the people's part was to be attentive. Here we had Ezra reading the word of God. We had others who were teaching all for the purpose of the people understanding the very word of God. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was governor in Ezra, the priests and the scribes, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the Lord. And Okay, a bit unusual here. The word is being taught, but the people are weeping. And why is that? They're under conviction. They're being convicted. Because as you read the word of God, you understand God is holy. And that God, in fact, has a plan. And he has described and told us clearly how we are to live in his world. And not only that, you had Israel here, who was his people that he chose, whom he said, I am your God, you will be my people. This was a very particular group. And, and so as they heard it and they read it and they began to understand it, they wept because they were convicted. Verse 10, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the, our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so this seems a bit out of left field, does it not? But if you notice here, this day is holy. It's a feast. What they're doing is this. They're celebrating the mercy of God. The mercy of God is seen, obviously, in Israel's history. Even though they were very rebellious, he, he took them and he saved them. And so on this day, yes, they are convicted, but they are also full of joy. Why? Because the Lord is merciful. And so it wasn't seasonal to keep on weeping. They were to actually have a party. That's what this means. Go ahead and eat the fat and drink the sweet wine. Not only that, make sure you're generous to others because our entire nation needs to celebrate the Lord. And then this unusual connection, because he says, don't be grieved. Got it? Be joyful. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I know that's not an unusual uh, slogan, right? You've seen it on T-shirts. You've seen it on bumper stickers. You've seen it on coffee mugs. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But it is so important to see the context here in order to understand really what God is saying here. To understand what the connection is between joy and strength. Verse 11, uh, so the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. And so again, we see the, their rejoicing. Why? Because they understood the words that were declared to them. And so uh, what we see in this passage is a progression a, a kind of five-step progression. The first step was simply this. The people understood the word of God. Obviously, it begins with the word of God. And, and the next step is they, as they heard the word of God, they were convicted. And as they were convicted, they were cleansed. And, and, and out of this cleansing then came joy. And if we could, there we go. And, and out of this joy then came the strength for obedience. And if I could just take for a moment... You know, all of us are born into this world, and we're born into a very sin-cursed world. And if we're really honest, what are we? We're empty. We're empty. We're sad. We're frustrated. And, and, and so that's the experience of everyone in this sin-cursed world. And, and so what the temptation is for us is to go in two directions. One direction is simply this, to be gloomy meaning to be depressed, to always see the, the downside in everything. But there's also kind of a flip side, which is to be glib. And maybe that's not a word you're used to hearing, but glib is just simply to be shallow or superficial. 
It, it, it's like where a group of people are grieving and someone comes up and tells a, a joke, right? It, it's not proper. It doesn't fit. It's superficial. And so that's our temptation. And, and that's true of everyone. But for the people of God, this is what we have. We start with the Word of God and then we begin to understand it. This, the Word of God is not magical per se. What I mean is it is spiritual, but as the Word of God is preached, it is our job to hear it, to receive it, to understand it. And, and so that's step one. But as we know, as we begin to hear the Word of God, next is we're going to be convicted. And for the people of God, this is a unique temptation. Because as you begin to get convicted of your sin, it's not going to feel good. And there will be a temptation to do this. Number one, to go and become gloomy. Oh, woe is me. I'm a sinner. I don't know, God, why you chose me. I'm terrible. I'll never get this. And, and, and you just go off on the gloomy side. But there's also another temptation is this, to be glib. And what I mean by that is you're convicted of sin and you think, you know what, everyone else sins. It's not that big of a deal. Well, it is a big deal. You know why? Because it's our sin that put the Messiah on the cross. And so we know then the process is, as you understand God's word, you're convicted, is to understand the cleansing. And how do we know that? We know that from the gospel. The gospel tells us that, in fact, our sin is on the Son, and his righteousness is imputed unto us. And that surely is joy, is it not, to know that we are no longer under the wrath of God, that I don't have to try to earn his favor, that I will not be punished for my sins the, the way I deserve to be punished. But this then leads to obedience. And as Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because indeed, that group of people, they needed strength. They were war-torn. They had been disciplined. They, they were a remnant. They were uh, surrounded. They were occupied. They were devastated. They needed to hear this. That indeed, they could be strong. Why? Because of the Lord. And likewise, for us as a church, we need to hear this as well. That we need to be strong, and it is possible, possible to be strong. How? Because of the joy of the Lord. And so how do we keep our eye on the gospel here? How do we keep our eye on the gospel such that we're going through this process continually? Well, let's jump to the New Testament and, and read Paul's encouragement, not Paul, but the writer of Hebrews' encouragement to the Hebrews. And so looking at verse 1 of chapter 12, we'll begin there. He says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so I realize we're kind of uh, just pulling out a verse, but if we were to go to chapter 11, if you're in your scripture, you can see that. Uh, that's, if you will, the hall of fame of those who had faith. Those who had faith. And so we're surrounded by them. And there are a cloud of witnesses. Now, I've heard this before, uh, is that we are, they are in like an amphitheater and they're spectators watching us. No, that's not the true sense of it. They are witnesses in the sense that they are testifying. They are testifying. When you look at their life, it testifies, what? That God is faithful. He's had given them promises, and maybe they didn't see the fulfillment, but they believed in God. And so that testifies to us. It encourages us to do what? To lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and run. Run with endurance. And so, again, he's speaking plural. This is us as a church. What are we to do? We are to run the race with endurance. And, and of course, as we're doing it as a church, we as individuals have to do it as well. And if we're going to run with endurance, that means we need strength. Does it not? There's no way to run a race without the strength to, to finish the race and, and to compete according to the rules. And if you notice, he does two things here. He tells them to lay aside every weight. Now, in the context here of the Hebrews, the weight they were really bearing most likely was simply this, legalism. 
legalism. They were trying to achieve and bring uh, the pleasure of God by them fulfilling the law, something they couldn't do, and it was heavy on them. And obviously the other extreme is, is sin, allowing sin to exist. And, and I know we've talked about this before, but there's a couple ways really that we as humans try to achieve joy. Uh, one of them is through works. We're trying to please God, and we do it through works. But this really is a weight. Oh, it's a heavy weight. And it really ends up in a dead end. And, and so you might call it religion. There's another, another extreme, which I would call irreligion. In other words, they don't take sin very seriously. And, 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 and for, for this group of people, they also find it's a dead end. Because it doesn't matter whether you try to obey God or you say, nah, there is no God. You're not going to, if you will, find God. But God has found us. How so? Through the gospel. He comes to us. We don't arrive at him. He comes to us. The gospel is announced to us. You heard the gospel announced. It came from the outside to you. And so for the Hebrews, they needed to lay off any weights that was holding them back. They needed to lay off the sin. And that will help them to run the race with endurance. And, 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 and so uh, let's actually go to verse 2. Because now let's look in particular at Jesus. Because it says here, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so our job is to look, get our eyes off everything else, and look to Jesus, who's the founder and perfecter of our faith. He's the pioneer. He's the one who blazed the trail of faith. He not only blazed the trail, he perfected it. He was the one who has uh, shown us what, how life is to be lived. And, and in order to show us that, I want to jump back in time to a point right before Jesus' crucifixion. So this is in Matthew 26. Jesus is the night before he is to be crucified. And he takes with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And you're saying, well, well hold on. But we are to be joyful at all times, are we not? Here is the Son of Man who is sorrowful and troubled. Well, how can that be? Please understand that joy is foundational. It is a deep and abiding pleasure and gladness in God. And for God the Son, it is a deep and abiding pleasure in God the Father and God the Spirit. That is deep. It, it doesn't mean he's not going to experience other emotions. Obviously, he is. It, it would be inappropriate for him to be telling jokes, if you will, on the cross. Would it not? That wouldn't fit. Here he is. He wept when we wept. And, and, and he's feeling the sorrow of all the weight that's on him before he knows what he is about to go through. Uh, verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful. Again, emphasizing that fact, even to death, remain here and watch with me. In verse 39, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, nonetheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is trust. This is faith. The Son of God trusting in God the Father. Not my will, your will. He's the, the, the founder, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. So let's go back to, to verse 2 of Hebrews. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, who for the joy that was set before him what did he do? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And, and if I will, can you give me a blank, blank screen? Let's talk about that just for a moment. The cross, he endured the cross. Prior to the cross, we know he was betrayed by a friend, correct? He was even denied by Peter, again, a friend. He, you know, I don't know if you could really call it a court, 
Uh, but the, the evil rulers of that age, they put him on trial. Uh, he was mocked and scourged by who? Godless soldiers. He suffered pain, shame, anguish. Why? Because he was crucified on the cross, the, the, the worst possible type of death. And as bad as this is, right, because we could show you a clip from a movie and we'd all be in tears like, oh, wow. Here's the worst part. The wrath of God, the sinless one who became sin. This is what Jesus knew he had to experience. This is what he went through. And he didn't go through it begrudgingly. He went through it eagerly and willingly. How so? Because of the joy set before him. The joy gave him the strength. The joy set before him. He wasn't obeying like, oh, okay, I've got to obey here. No, he did it eagerly and willingly, completely cognizant of the situation, which called upon him to be sorrowful and troubled because this is such a terrible event, and yet he knew the joy that was set before him. Let's finish out this, this portion in Hebrews. Consider him who endured, again, strength from sinners, such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. the opposite of strength. Verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And again, this this tells us this is what we are engaged in as a church. We're struggling against sin. We need to resist. And so what do we need? We need strength. And so what he's doing here is obviously bringing us a, a, a good set of, uh, of perspective that what we're engaged in doesn't even compare to what Christ had to engage in. And, and so uh, what I want to do is just kind of step aside just for a moment to talk about us. And what I mean is this. We live in a hostile world. We, we have a sin nature. And, and so what we do is we tend to seek for joy, absolutely, but we, we have, if you will, an equation for joy. And if you didn't do good in math, sorry, and if you love math, you're going to love the next uh, two minutes. Joy, in our minds, we equate it with X. Now, X may be money. It may be a relationship. It may be stuff. Whatever it is, we tend in our mind to say this, oh, if I had that, I will be joyful. And then when we realize that really doesn't make us joyful, we'll add something else, right? We'll add comfort. We'll add food. We'll add, uh, you know, the Cowboys winning the Super Bowl. Maybe that will bring us joy. And when that doesn't fill us up, we'll add something else. That's a Z. X, Y, and Z. And, and when that doesn't fill us up, then we'll say, well, as long as I don't have this, which is stress, if I just didn't have stress in my life, I'll be so much happier. And, and if I didn't have this health ailment, I would be so much joyful. Do you, do you see how we define joy? And, and, and that's just in our sin nature. And what God does is he comes and says this, here is biblical joy, here is true joy, and it is this, knowing the Lord. It is knowing the Lord. And, and the Word of God reveals the Lord to us. We ourselves, if we were to, to try to come up with the definition of the Lord and define Him, it would be an idol. And that's why we need to understand the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to listen to the Word of God. Because what it's doing is it's revealing who the Lord actually is. Is. And, and, and for us, what we find is that because our joy is limited when we try this equation, we end up having no strength. No strength. We're not able to resist temptation because what is Satan going to do? He's going to come and say this. You know what? God doesn't really care for you because if he did, he'd give you that. Here's the path to get it. And it's really not that big of a deal. And you can always ask for forgiveness later. The temptation sets us up for failure, which just puts us on a downward spiral where we do not have strength. And if we were to really look at the gospel, the gospel is not aiming at these types of things. 
The gospel is not aiming to give you more stuff. It's not aiming, if you will, to give you more comfort. It's not aiming to, to meet whatever desires you have. No, they're bigger and better. And what are those? It's all about him. It's about how we can be in a relationship with the Lord. How we can get to know him and deal with our biggest problem, which is, of course, we're under the wrath of God unless he takes it himself, which he did on the cross. And so this is and sets us up for having strength that we need for daily living. Uh, one more verse, uh, John 15, 11. And Jesus is speaking. He just talked about how we are, he's the vine, we are the branches. And he says this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And we think about Jesus, God the Son. He was in relationship with the Father. And he was in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in relationship with the Father. You know what there is? This is mutual love, mutual trust, mutual joy. Mutual trust, mutual love, mutual joy. And Jesus says this, my joy will be in you. Now that's a promise. That's a promise. The very joy that the Son has for the Father and that the Son has for the Spirit and that the Son experiences from the Father and how he experiences from the Spirit, that joy will be in us that our joy may be full. And so if, if I could to, to come around, obviously today we need strength. We need strength to live. We need strength, uh, particularly in our culture, which is very hostile to the church, right? Right now, it's, it's dangerous for the church to say this, that's a sin. Nope, that's a sin. Just try it and see what happens. It is dangerous that it's the pressure on us to conform to the world, to fit into the world's agenda, not to call out sin. And there's pressure on us not to be doctrinally distinctive. In other words, to say, no, this is what the word of God says. No, this is what God tells us what we are to do. We are going to do it. There is pressure on us. And so we as a church, we indeed need to be very strong. But how do we get that? We get it from joy. We get it from joy. And this joy is not, a glue, is not something that, that we just generate within ourselves, right? It is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. And what does that mean? Number one is that we delight in him. Absolutely. As we read God's word and we understand it, we see who Jesus is and we say, yes, he's awesome. I delight in him. A second is his, his joy itself is, is ours. He says, I, my joy I give to you. But we're limited in, in, in our ability to be joyful. And yet Jesus says, I'm going to give you my joy. Our capacity for joy has just increased infinitely. And third, let us not forget future joy. The joy that is set before us. Uh, if we look at Matthew 25, 21, Jesus is teaching, and he says this through a parable. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. There is the joy that is set before us. We not only have the joy of delighting in God. We not only have the son's joy as he gives it to us. We have future joy that is set before us. Just as the son experienced the future joy of sitting at the right hand of the father and bringing to him all those that the father has given him, so we as well, we look forward to being in the very presence of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is why Paul could say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let's pray, and the band's going to be coming up here. Uh, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for your Holy Spirit who helps us to understand your word. And Lord, uh, we as a church body uh, confess our sin to you. We know that your spirit is convicting us 
and, and uh, not only us as a church, but individually. But thank you for the good news of the gospel that Jesus himself has become sin for us. Thank you for his perfect life, his atoning death. Thank you that he is risen from the dead. Thank you that he is seated at the right hand of God. And we look forward to his return. Thank you for joy that yields strength. Amen.